Man, I'm so excited to be back, y'all. Crickets. <laughs> By the way, if you're new, uh, maybe a lot of you are new. That's what's up. So uh, I've been gone for six weeks. So for some of you, I'm not back. I'm Jordan, okay? You need to, you need to know that I uh, started this church with my wife eight years ago. And I just been on a little bit of sabbatical, and so I just came back. So if I haven't met you, I'm so glad that you're here, and uh, I'm just amazing to see all the new faces. So welcome to you. And uh, again, uh, just by way of introducing myself, even to everyone joining online today, uh, while I was on sabbatical, our, our church turned eight years old. Amazing, amazing, eight years old, and we're just reflecting back. On how it began with 12 people and then God, you know, in the, the hunger and passion to just see God move, man, we're just seeing God touch heart after heart and change life after life and do his work that he does. And so it's such a blessing to be a part of it. But I also want to just give a huge shout out to our incredible team that led so well while I was gone. That's why people came and didn't even know like the, the lead pastor was gone because church was awesome anyway. And so I want to shout out Pastor Shane, Pastor Daniel, and all of our leaders here that just continue to do an amazing job uh, just leading our church. And, um, you know, also one of the things I just was reflecting back as I was coming here was in the last seven weeks, listen, we've had seven different people speak from this stage. That's incredible. All of it amazing. And guess what? All seven of them from this house, from this house. That's incredible. And so I just think, man, God is doing something unique and something special. And uh, I love that he's just raising, raising up. Uh, leaders in, in our church, and I'm fired up because we're going to be launching a series for the summer in the book of Galatians, okay, in the book of Galatians, and, and, and I, I had this thought as I was coming back, I was like, you know, I feel kind of like Robin Williams in the movie Hook, you know, where he shows up back in Neverland, and he's like a little older and a little fatter, and he's not sure if he can fly anymore, <laughs> that's how I feel, okay, <laughs> uh, but God reassured me that I could still fly. And so, because I'm going to preach his word at you today. And so I'm going to be dropping dimes. I hope you brought your bucket today. Also, what I mean is I hope you brought like a journal or something to write the good things that the Lord shares. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm excited to be here. We're going to jump in the book of Galatians. And before that, you know, I think it's amazing. We, we as a country celebrated Juneteenth yesterday. And like it's one of those things. Yeah, we could celebrate and it's, it's one of those things where it's like both like a day where we celebrate and it's also one of those days where it's like you, you almost mourn because there's some sad parts to the history of it as well. And so you just think about the whole story of Juneteenth and like what it meant. And, I, and, and, and for those of you maybe a little unfamiliar with it, it's like this idea that there were people who were uh, living in slavery in the South after they had already been set free. And, and so the, the, the war had been won, right, by the north. Freedom had been declared, but for several years, there were still people being told that they were slaves and not knowing anything about being set free. That's crazy, right? Until Juneteenth happened, and that's the day where, like, the final uh, frontier, if you will, down in the south, where people were finally told, hey, you've been living in slavery. You don't have to live in anymore. It's been declared, the war's been won, you've been set free, right? And so again, it's an amazing connection to the series that we're going in. Because listen, the same thing happens to us in the spirit. Do you know that? And so Paul is, is writing in this book of Galatians. He's going, man, so oftentimes in churches, people have been bought by the blood of Jesus. The war has been won, and yet we still live in slavery. And guess what? Oftentimes it's religion that does it. But then someone comes along and says, no, nah, no, nah, you don't got to live under that anymore. Listen, thought they had me. That's the name of the series. Thought they had me. Just imagine that moment where you realize, wait a minute, for years I've been living this way and I can be free. I want to tell somebody today, listen, you need to experience a new freedom in Christ. And sometimes, oftentimes, it's religion that gets in the way. Do I need to remind you, listen, Paul is writing to a church to live free in Christ because religious people were stealing their freedom. Did I remind you today who killed Jesus? Religious people. I still got one more service. I better chill out. And so if your expression of faith feels religious and not free, we better get back to the good news of the gospel. Because maybe we messed something up, right? 
Because we're, we're called to live in the joy of Jesus, the abundant life, the freedom, the good news of the gospel. And so again, I'm so excited that this series is going to be our, our summer series, and uh, I can't wait to see what God does. But however, uh, before that, I know our church is such an amazing church, and, and I've already run into everybody, they're like, man, how was your time off? I'm like, I could have every conversation like that, but it's going to take forever. So can I just share a little bit about my time? Is that cool? It would save us all a lot of time. <laughs> uh, so it, it was awesome. So uh, I got these last six weeks off from the pulpit, and uh, the first week was amazing because we uh, welcomed a nephew into the world. We got a, a new nephew uh, on Janae's side. Uh, uh, baby Ledger was born. It was amazing to Jillian and Jean, so shout out to them. And my kids are just stoked out of their mind to have a little cousin. And then uh, after that, I got to go to the coast and do some golfing with my dad and my brothers. The golfing was not good. The time was great, though. The weather was great over there, too. And, uh, and it was just cool because my brothers, though they're not here, one's in Colorado and one's out in Madeira, um, they're like close, close friends to me. Not just brothers, but close friends. And they love me more than they love the church, and so they can check in with me, and they're, they're just incredible supporting cast. So it was amazing to get to spend time with them. Uh, I got to spend time with Janae. We got to, to hang out together. Uh, I got to go uh, on some, some time with the family. Um, and, and by the way, it's been funny because some people are like, oh, Jordan, it's cool that you got to go on vacation. I'm like, listen, when you're home and there's kids around, that ain't no vacation. <laughs> right? That ain't no vacation. There's kids around. Right? When you go somewhere with your kids, that's called a trip you go on. Because at the end, everybody's tripping. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, we need to get everything back in line. Hey. No, nah, I love my kids, actually. We had a great time, and we were tripping at times, but we're, we're doing good. Um, I also got to go to five different states. I drove out to Colorado, went through five different states. It was amazing. And um, you know what's cool about that is you get to see that in other places people do things different. And that's okay. If you've never been out of California, you should try it sometime. I'm just saying. It's amazing to go in different places and go, oh my gosh, they do things different and it also works there. So I only say that because how many of you know sometimes if you have limited exposure, you're going to have limited vision? And I'm not saying that so that everyone will move away. I'm saying that it's just good to go and get exposed to other ways of doing things so we can do things better. It's like that in the church. I got to visit other churches. I got to just get exposed so that hopefully we can be just better, right? And I can be better. And I can be a better leader. And so I got to enjoy some time traveling and I also read seven books. I don't remember none of that stuff, man. That was a bad, like seven books in six weeks? Nah, I should have read a half a book for seven weeks and just like chewed on it. That's another story. God will redeem it somehow. Something will pop up, probably in the middle of this message. Here's some things. God taught me a bunch of things. I'm going to list like 12 things. It's going to take a while, so I hope you're comfortable. So things that I was just processing, like coming away from sabbatical, what did I learn? Here's the first thing. Ready? Super spiritual. I still love country music. I do. I'm from Chowchilla. The roots are deep. And I'm not talking about that new stuff, okay? You're like, that new song. I don't know the new song. I don't listen to the new stuff, okay? I was in the middle of Wyoming with nothing to do. There was nothing to see. So I just put on the country music with the 90s playlist, right? Could you, would you, ain't you gonna, if I ask you, would you wanna be my baby tonight, right? <laughs> if you don't know that song, look it up. That's good lyrics. How do you write that stuff? I just don't do it like they used to. I sound so old. Uh, so anyway, that was good times. Uh, here's the other thing I learned. It's a big world out there. And... God is moving all over the place. I hope that encourages somebody today. That God is at work. He's moving in other states. The church is growing. Okay? I mean the big church. God is continuing to, sh to spread his love and the message of the gospel. It doesn't always look like that. But sometimes we get so locally uh, focused we forget God is the God of the whole world. And he's at, and he's at work. Okay? One of the things that I love doing um, uh, is I visited a few other churches on Sundays. And, you know, after I got over the crying as I'm driving there, wishing I was here, you know, I'm like uh, talking to the Lord and going, Lord, I'm going to this church. I, I don't know much about it. I'm walking in as a new person. But I'm like, Lord, 
to speak to me, whatever, you know, however I can receive. And let me just say this, listen, if you ask God to speak to you, he will speak to you. If you hunger for God, he will feed you. If you call out to him, he will answer. If you want wisdom from God, he will answer. If the heart is seeking, God will provide. It's amazing. So I learned, and I, I, I kind of knew this theologically, but I learned it like literally is like as I went to other churches that God is not limited to just this atmosphere. God is not bound by the building of Via Church, okay? That God is at move all over our city, and I hope that encourages you. Because it's amazing to see that God is there. Like, I don't know these people. I, I, you know, we, we do things differently, but we have one God, and we're on one team, right? And God is able to change our city through all the expressions. And so, really, really cool to get to experience that. And I never want to think, like, this is the way, what, the only way. Um, and so, but that being said, I also realized as I went and checked out other places that I also just love our church. Like if I wasn't the pastor here, and I pray I am for a while, a long while, uh, I would still want to come here because the heart of this church, because of who we try to reach that's much different than other churches, and who we want to be, and the vision for this church that God gave this church. And so again, it's just a blessing that I get to come back being so excited. I didn't want necessarily to like be away from the church, but I'm so excited to come back, so excited to be here. And I think, again, God is just getting started. Here's the other thing I learned, probably in Utah, before I got to Wyoming, before I went to country music, I was doing some worship music, you know? Uh, and I realized my first love in ministry is leading in worship. It is. I, had to, I have to settle for preaching now because I can't hang with this team. They're too good. Um, but I, I, when I first got saved, like I was into music and I loved just leading worship. And I realized well, as I was like singing worship, you know why? Because I just want God to get so much praise. And there's something about when you lead worship, you get to see God getting so much praise. And it's just, it's like when Jesus, when you know what he's done for you, you just want him to get so much praise. Like he needs more. And so we need to tell more people. And then they praise him. And then he gets more praise. That's what happens when God changes you is you just want him to get more praise. Uh, but now I've realized, listen, this is crazy as I process this, but is that preaching, my gift is doing the same thing. Like, I also have a goal to preach so that at the end of my message, God gets more praise. That your eyes are open, your heart is awakened to, to, for you to understand how good God is and that you give him glory because of it. And then I went even a step further in my understanding and realized, listen, everybody who serves, that's the same thing. The reason why we serve at the church in whatever expression, whether that's greeting or in our kids' hall, right, or uh, on stage or whatever, whatever area we serve in is also that God gets more glory. And so the heart who's on fire to see God get one more ounce of praise goes, of course I'll serve. And then if you're like me, you have to settle for where your gifting is. It's not always where you want it to be. But if God calls you to it, right, you do it, and God will get more glory out of it. And so uh, I'm going to settle for preaching, but I kind of like it too. I kind of like it too. And... Um, Here's number six, I learned this. I learned that my first priority and my first calling in life is not to pastor via church. It's to pastor my own heart and to lead my heart into the presence of God. I have to do that. Like before anything at this church, I have to lead my heart into the presence of God. Secondly, to love my wife. Thirdly, to pastor my children and Lord help me. It's the biggest thing I pray about all the time. How can I raise these kids to just, parents, feel me on this. So that they love you for who you are, but they don't have to go through what I went through to figure that out. God, give them a heart to know how good you are. And so that's my prayer. And, and the Bible says you shouldn't even lead a church if you can't lead your family. And so I need you to help me care about that too. Because here's the thing, if I can lead my family well and my heart into the presence of God, then God's going to anoint this place. He's going to bring fire through me. He's going to bring fire to you. If you help me, then God will help you. And so it's just really important that I can't get that priority mixed up. I have to love my family. I have to pastor my own heart. Uh, here's the next one, number, number seven. I'm as dedicated as ever right now coming back that this church, Via Church, will be a hospital for broken people. That we're going to be a place of healing for people. That we're going to try to reach out to people who are going through pain, who are going through oppression, who are going through addiction. We care about that stuff. 
and we don't want to run from it. We want to get to it, and we want to be a part of the solution. We want to actually pray what Jesus said, which is to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. We believe that there's a spiritual battle going on, and we are called to be a part of it, and so we want to help people, okay? So that's what we're here. We're going to help people who are desperate for the Lord. Uh, here's, uh, here, here's the next one. Number eight is that without the Holy Spirit, there's nothing I can do that's spiritually significant. I can't. Uh, I can try. I can get better. I can read seven plus eight books maybe next time and see if I can get better. But if I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit coming out of my time with God, then spiritual, there's nothing spiritually significant that's going to happen. But here's the thing. If I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then God can move mountains. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, right, can move in your heart to do the impossible, to do incredible things you never dreamed of. But it doesn't start with the work. It starts with resting in Jesus and what he's done and letting your soul be filled. Here's the next one. Ready? I'm not here and I'm not called to entertain a crowd. Okay? I'm here to lead an army. And I need you to see yourself as that way. As it's not, I come in here and just see if Jordan can keep my attention, right? I'm going to try, okay? I'm going to talk about Jesus. If I can't keep you awake, I'm going to try to yell, but sometimes that doesn't actually help. I don't know what to do. I'm going to try to get better at that. But at the same time, like, if you realize you're here not to be entertained, you won't fall asleep. If you're here knowing you're a soldier that needs to get fed the word so you can go fight the fight, right, then it'll change this environment. Because when we leave here, we want our families to be different. We want our community to be different. We want to change things, right? And so, again, it's spiritual battle. So we come in here and we realize, man, I need to be filled with the power of God. I'm a soldier that needs weapons to fight. And I need a fellow, a fellow army to fight with, to encourage and to, to strengthen us. And so it changes the way that this experience happens. And when you realize Jordan's not here to entertain me. He's here to encourage me, and the word's here to fuel your fire, too, in the fight. We're an army, right, to bring the kingdom of God. Here's number 10, and this is easy to say, hard to live out. Ready? I would rather have fire in this house, fiery people, fire, passion for the Lord, than the finer things that churches can have or whatever, than the finer things in life. You walk around our campus, there's always something broken we're trying to fix. There's always something we have plans for. We're trying to do something with the club. We got the rooms we need to figure out. We, we can't do it all at once, but you know what we do have here is we have the fire of God in this house. And we've had it from the beginning. And I don't want to forsake it for anything else. And, and, and so again, that, that's going to change how and why we do things the way that we do. From style to music to outreach to whatever to why we're in downtown Fresno and why we're in Clovis. It, it matters just as much. And, and so there's a crazy story in the Bible, and I think it's in Acts chapter 8, where Holy Spirit's on fire with Peter and with John, and this, this wealthy uh, guy named Simon comes up and says, hey, uh, how can I get the miracles that you have and the power of God in my life? Let me pay you for it. Peter goes, what? You think your wealth is going to buy the work of God? He says, let your money be cursed if you think money controls God. He says, you better go get your heart right. And we've always, we've stood to this principle from day one, and it has been hard. And one thing, it's so easy to say, but it's really hard to live out. And so we're going to be a church where money doesn't control the vision around here. You just have to be that way. And in the day that money starts controlling and telling us what to do the, is the day we lose the fire. And I'd rather keep the fire burning. And if you're, and here's the thing about Jesus, what's amazing is both the poor and he had wealthy followers. He had both. But they were all like submitted to him in the kingdom, not trying to control him. And so I just want to encourage you, there are a lot of churches in town where money creates the vision. And we can't do that. So pray for me, because that is probably one of my greatest temptations. Every pastor faces it. Hey, you should do this different, because I can give more if you do that. I don't want to do that. I want God to reach lost souls. And we want to be here for the kingdom. So again, that's one of those things where if you have a sabbatical, you start wrestling with the inner parts of your spirit, right? And so again, um, that, that matters to me. Here's the next one. This is really good. I am unconditionally loved by God. 
And, and sometimes you gotta pause on that word unconditional for a while. Like to be unconditionally loved, which means whatever I do going forward, listen to me, doesn't change God's thoughts towards me. That I'm a child of God. And the same is true for you. That going forward, it doesn't change God's thoughts towards you. Like, yeah, if you ain't living right, is God going to work in your life? Sure. The Lord disciplines those he loves. But he loves you. That's why he works in your life. You get that? So, so his love never changes. And I, I have to rest in that. And here's the, here's the last one. Ready? Uh, the greatest takeaway. And this happened over and over again towards the end. It got real, like, more intensified. That God just gave me two words over and over again. Ready? It's not that deep. He said, don't fear. Don't fear. Because I realize how often in times do we live just to, to please other people or think about what other people think or I fear my own self or I fear, all of us fear in some ways, right? Situations, finances, the future, health, whatever it is. And God said, don't fear. And you're like, oh man, that doesn't sound super spiritual. But this is amazing. Did you know like every leader in the Bible, that was like what God always told them? <laughs> Moses, don't fear anymore. Abraham, don't fear. Everybody, stop fearing. Peter, stop fearing. Don't fear. Over 360 times in the Bible, it's like the most repeated command. Jordan, what took you so long to get it? Like, God wants to speak a word to you today. Ready? Don't fear. Don't fear. But there's more, more to that. Like, why do we, why do we fear so often? And uh, today I want to I wanna preach a message called the prison of people pleasing. The prison of people pleasing. Because if you live your whole life trying to please other people, it's going to be a prison for you. And you will not feel the freedom of Christ. And so we need to break out of the, the, the prison. And how do you do that? Well, here's the thing. It's interesting. There's a connection, I think, and I've seen this over and over again, to how we live in the fear of other people. A lot of it's connected to our experience with our earthly fathers. Because it starts off with identity. It starts off with how we feel accepted or not accepted, and therefore we try to live for the acceptance of others, and that starts when we're young, how we feel towards ourselves, and so it really matters, and so what I want to do today is get us to lift our eyes up and to get our eyes on our heavenly Father, and for you, I'm hoping to understand who God says you are, how he has given you a new identity, and then out of his approval in your life, you can live with his authority, not to try to please everyone else and live in that prison. And by the way, when I say, you know, the, the people-pleasing thing, I'm not talking about being a jerk, <laughs> okay? Don't be like, I'm not a people-pleaser, so I'm mean to people. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, the Bible still says, be loving, be kind, be generous, all those things. Just don't live for the need of their approval. Because there's going to be a day where you and I have to decide, are we living for this person or are we living for God? Right? And so in those moments, we got to elevate our eyes and go, man, I need to know who I am so then I can go where God wants me to go. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. This is great. It says this. This is a letter from Paul, an apostle, and, and he says this. He says, I was not appointed by any group of people uh, or any human authority but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. <laughs> I love this. He just gets right to it. Starts talking about his identification. Here's the thing. So Paul's letter in Galatians is a confrontational letter. He's writing to a church who's been taken under kind of uh, uh, misguided by uh, uh, religious people to live under like... Um, slavery to religion instead of freedom in Christ and Paul's going to come at them he's going to con confront them and he's going to speak very hard words to them okay so confrontation is coming but what I love is that Paul doesn't start with confrontation he starts with identification I don't know if you noticed the first verse but he says man I Paul an apostle like right there at the beginning he says my name is Paul which let me just remind somebody today listen he wasn't born with that name that's the name God gave him because God changed him because he ain't who he used to be because God did a new thing in his life somebody today you need to realize God did a new thing in your life quit calling yourself the old name you ain't shame no more you're alive now you're free now you're joy now come on somebody get excited that Jesus gave you a new name you got to understand, you are not who you used to be. No matter what your upbringing is or was, when God got you, he changed you. You are now child of God. And so he says, 
I am Paul, right? So for him, he's like, I'm a new person. And I'm an apostle. In other words, you didn't send me here. I didn't send myself. God sent me here. That's what that word apostle means. Literally, Jesus is the one who sent him. And then he gets into, not by the human authority or by uh, appointed by a group of people, but God who raised Jesus from the dead. This is so good. Because listen to me, you are going to face confrontation as a Christian. Even if it's with yourself in this life, you're going to face confrontation. You know where you need to start? With identification. Who you are. Any of y'all ever had that experience where you went to get something and they said, let me see your ID? You went, oh, hey, relax. I'm not talking about your ladies night at Yard House on Friday, okay? I'm not talking about that. Someone feels so guilty. Right? That was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> I'm talking about, for some reason, last week at CVS, I tried to buy some, some coloring books. And I paid. And he's like, hey, or, uh, yeah, something like that. I don't know what order it went. He's like, hey, let me see your ID. I'm like, man, I'm just buying some coloring books. I'm like, let me look at them coloring books. What kind of coloring books are they you need to see my ID for? Making sure I'm not giving my kids the wrong stuff. No, they were regular coloring books. So you want to see my ID? Uh, and, and, and you know what? He, he saw my ID. He goes, all right, there, there you go. So then the purchase went through, right? But it, it's not just that. Sometimes it's anything else, a zoo, wherever you go. Sometimes you, you want to get something, but then they need to know your ID, right? And how you handle the confrontation in that moment is all a matter of your identification. Guess what? I showed him. I said, pow, look at that. It matches the card. So it went through. Let me tell you something today. When you face confrontation, God has given you an identification to press on through. The question is, do you know your ID now? Do you know your new ID? Are you living in the new identification as child of God? Not slave to sin, child of God, right? And so again, to live in the identification that God has for you. And I love you. He says, I'm not appointed by anyone else. I've been appointed by God. Listen, do you know that about yourself? You're, you're anointed and appointed by God, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. That is your ID. And so you face what you face with the power to get through it if you know who you are in Christ. He says this in verse 2. Check this out. He says, all the, the brothers and the sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. I think this is amazing. Because a lot of times people are just like, yeah, Paul wrote the letter to the Galatian church, but... He says it was Paul, and then he goes through who Paul is, but then he says, hey, and it's with all the brothers and sisters that we send this to you. In other words, I'm not just doing life by myself. You know why that matters today? Listen to me. It's because you can be appointed by God, you can be anointed by God, but if you try to do life by yourself, it ain't going to work. How many of you know our faith is a community faith? We need each other. Don't keep showing up in isolation. Get involved. Join core. Join via life because you need people around you. Your identity is given to you by the Father, but it's lived out in community. You need to be strengthened by the people around you. And what God does in you, listen to me, what God does through you is either going to be limited or unleashed by who you have around you. So it's really important that you and I understand that church is not an isolation thing, that we need to get involved. We need to be here with one another. Look at verse 3. It says, may the God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I could preach a whole message on that line. I think I've done it before, actually. That's the whole thing right there. Because every single person in this room, you know you need grace? You need grace. And you know what grace gives you? Peace. There isn't a person in this room who doesn't need peace with God that only comes through the grace of Jesus Christ. Even if this is your first time today, first time joining us online, what you need is the grace of God that comes through no other name but Jesus Christ. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you turn from the old life and you receive it, you get peace with God. It's amazing. Therefore, you don't have to live to please everyone else. You have peace with God. That's incredible. And then he says it, verse 4. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father had planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. Verse 5, all glory to God forever and ever. And somebody say amen. amen. And so I love this because he just basically like, all right, I'm going to just refresh you with the gospel, right? Jesus gave his life. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead. And by the way, that was also a part of God's plan. 
And in the end, it's going to bring God glory forever and ever. That's amazing. That's why one day we long to just go be with God and give him the glory, right? And to see Jesus face to face. Well, one day that's coming. But right now we're still living life. And how many of you know sometimes life has pain? Sometimes we're in the middle of it. That's why I think it's so powerful that he mentions Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, but it was all by the plan of God. Because some of you here today are like, pain, no, no, no pain. Pain's not a part of the plan. Yeah, well, maybe it is. Pain's a part of life, and God always has a plan. So the two run together. You're going to experience pain. You know, the Bible never says you're not going to experience pain. But here's what the Bible says, that pain is not the destination, it's just along the pathway. But all the pathways in Christ, with Christ, everyone in here, your pathway with Christ will have a destination that ends in glory. This is why in the middle of your pain, you don't give up, you realize God's doing something. Keep pressing on. It's not the destination, and it's just along the path, and God is with you in it. And so if you don't give up, in the end, God's going to get glory out of it. He's going to move in your story to do something amazing if you will press on. If that's you today, even if you're joining online, you couldn't come today because you have too much pain in your heart. And you don't want to be seen around people. The reality is God is with you, and God is going to get us through it. And in the end, he's going to get glory out of it. And so he, he just drops the gospel. Now, 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 after all of that, verse 6, and, and question for you. This is when the confrontation comes. <laughs> question for you. How do you handle when you got to have a hard conversation with someone? Are you the butter them up kind of person? You look so good today. Hey, by the way, I need to talk to you about something, right? You're like, Paul, hey, I know who I am. Jesus died and rose from you. Now, hold on. Jeff rose for you. Here we go, right? Just drop the gospel on them real quick. So here it comes. He says, I'm so shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. Okay, I need you to pause for a second and realize this is true. This is true of a lot of people. Start off in their faith. Start off in the gospel. And they get caught up in something. Sometimes we've been caught up. I've been caught up in something that looked a lot like the gospel, but actually wasn't. Because it trapped me. Made me feel like I wasn't enough. Right? It was a pretending form of the good news. Verse 7. But it's not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Verse 8. This is heavy. Let God's curse fall on anyone including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcome, let that person be cursed. Is that not heavy? Right? That's weighty. Hey, you know whose ears should perk up when you read Galatians chapter 1? People like me. You know, you know, in the book of James, it says that if you preach the word, God is going to judge you more heavily than everyone else. That's dangerous. That's why I said, don't be eager to get in front of people and preach the word, because you better do it right. And, and Paul says, guess what you ought to preach? Good news! Sometimes, Jordan, I, I, people hate on me, the, the, the people elsewhere. Even last week, I got someone showed me a text with they say, you preach too much good news. <laughs> it's called good, followed by news. Not bad news. Which means every message needs to be fought with tears. So that someone walks out of here and goes, I cannot believe how good the love of God is for me. And I will live my whole life for him. Because God's way for you is better than your way for yourself. It's good news. And so, but, but what's the tendency with people is we always tend to uh, inflict shame on other people. And I've been there. I've been there. Somehow, sometimes we get saved and then all of a sudden we think we're better than everyone else. Start casting shade at everybody. Oh, you're not like it? Like you already forgot the grace that saved you. 
And it's actually hard to be a grace-preaching church. It's hard. Because you have to fight to both call people out of sin, because that's not good. That's bad. It's destroying you. It's destroying other people to call you out and realize, no, you can do that and be free from shame. Be set on high. Come out of the darkness. Live in freedom. Live in God's will for your life. Good news doesn't always mean easy news. Good news is oftentimes filled with hard news that we need to change, but you can't do it. Let Jesus do it. Surrender, and freedom will come, right? And so that's what makes it such hard work is to call people out of it, out of sin and darkness, into the light. It's really good, and e or sorry, it's really easy to do church where you just tell everyone what to do and be better. But that's not good news because I've tried that. It didn't work for me. I got to learn that Jesus is better, and I need him and depend on him every single day. And I want to read his word and make my life reflect what he wants it to look like. That's why I went on sabbatical, by the way. <laughs> it's because what I do is a lot of weight. You know, a lot of the, the, the hardest part of my job is, is uh, the weight, which is unseen, of verses like this. That if I don't get it right, man, I'm in big trouble, you know what I mean? It's that weighs on me. That's why it's kind of funny when people are like, oh, Jordan, it's nice you get to go on a vacation. I'm like, man, come on. I already told y'all, you got kids at home, right? And, and sabbatical is spiritual. It's a time to just go be with the Lord and let him work on your heart. And, uh, and so it's funny. So I, the, the reality was when I went on sabbatical, I didn't need to go on a vacation. In fact, I, I love my job and I'm very thankful for my job. And the reason why that is is because I was raised on a farm. <laughs> okay? I was raised on a farm. And when we were like five years old, it was like, get your butt up and work. Okay? So it was never summer break. It was summer break of sweat. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not kidding you. We would get up, you know, 6, 6.30 in the morning. You work all day. And then, then you go to football practice at 3.30 when it's 110. For some reason, they never canceled practices back then. It's messed up. So, so the reality was, is like, just like everybody in human history, I work in a job where there's air conditioning. I, it's like working on a vacation for people in human history. And so the reason why I went on sabbatical was not because I need a vacation. It's because I needed some spiritual rest. I needed, like, God to work in my heart, right? And so I, I always think about this because, you know, we always got good grades as kids. We, were, we couldn't wait till summer it was over. It's like... Woo, going back to school, right? You get to work on work, no problem, right? Here, here's a good free lesson for you, ready? You want your kids to love school in the fall? Give them a shovel during the summer. <laughs> Make them go outside. And here's the thing. It was never like, oh, it's hot, we're not working today. It was, oh, it's hot, you better get up earlier because the work still needs to get done. I just feel like we miss that sometimes, right? And then all of a sudden you're eager for air conditioning in the fall. It's great. The joy of the Lord, that's cool. So anyways, but here's the thing. Now, because of that, now my job, I, it's not that I need rest from this. It's like I have to realize that this weight matters, and every week I better preach as hard as I can so that somebody's life might be changed with the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to do here. We want to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Every time, listen, when we, we, have, we had seven speakers up here in the last seven weeks, right? Amazing. And when I meet with our speakers, the one thing I care about is just preach the gospel. Like how you do it, what you do, will grow. But what you cannot miss is preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Right? And that's what every single one of us needs is the good news of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. This is, this is deep. I hope we're ready for this. He says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal... I would not be Christ's servant. Ouch. Okay, when I read the Bible, there's like a couple ways in which it shows that Jesus responds when one day we die and we, we face God face to face. One is when he tells this person, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. He says that to a religious person, by the way, who did religion but didn't know Jesus. So did everything for the wrong reasons. And then there's another person that encounters, and the stories in the Bible where Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant, right? That you lived your life for me. 
And, and again, I don't know what the other responses are going to be. I'm just saying that those two are in the Bible, and I would rather be the one where he says, well done. <laughs> that's, that's what I would rather have. And did you see what Paul just said in the text? Did you see it? He said, you can either live to please people, or you can serve Jesus, but you can't do both. Woo! Like, that'll make you check your heart, right? Even if what you're doing is good, if you're doing it for yourself or for someone else, it's wrong. Because sometimes God's going to lead you to do things that cause confrontation. You can't do that if you're stuck in the prison of people pleasing all the time. You're dying inside. So he wants you to get out of that and get onward, right, in the army, right, to live going forward. And uh, I just think of that in the, this, in the sense of Jesus. Think about Jesus who... who yeah, he had many people who followed him, loved him. He also had people betray him. And then he had a big crowd who opposed him. Again, religious people. Funny and how ironic that is all the time. Religious people who end up killing him. Okay, so he had opposition. But guess what? He knew who he was. He had an identification so that in the confrontation, he can keep pressing forward. No one knew who he was as much as Jesus did. But you know what's so powerful is there's this... this, this uh, seen in the Bible where this identification gets portrayed publicly, where it happens, and, and it's in the life of Jesus. And this should match up with, with you and, and something you should understand today. It's in Matthew uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 16. It says this. This is right after, like, the story of when Jesus was a boy, and then he was, like, at the temple and got lost. He's like, I have to be in my father's house. And then, like, the next scene, you fast forward, and he's, like, 30, okay? So there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Right? Uh, and, and, but now he's an adult. And this is like the first thing that happens in his adult life. So this should matter. The first scene of Jesus' adult life. Verse 16, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, so he got baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Verse 17 and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with whom I am well pleased. This is so powerful. It's at the beginning of Jesus' life, or life, his ministry, right before his ministry. So right after this scene, he's going to go in the wilderness and be tempted, right? He's going to face the devil straight up, like face to face. And then he's going to go and do his first miracle. And then you know how that plays out. He's like healing people. Then he's opposed. Then he dies on the cross. Then he rises from the dead. Then he ends up ascending to heaven. He sits on the throne. One day he's going to return. Right? But how did his adult life begin? What happened before all that? Listen, he got baptized. Did Jesus need to get baptized for his own cleansing? No. Why did he do it? To show us something. And so he gets baptized, and in your Bible, this is so cool, you see the Father shows up, the Spirit shows up, and the Son is there. This is our God. Our God. Listen, if God exists in community, why would you think you don't need to? If the Father's there, the Spirit is there, why would you think you, got, you can do it alone? And so he gets baptized, and then the Father speaks over him and says, this is my Son, claims him, who I love, in whom I am well pleased. You know, deep inside of every person in this room, deep inside of you, every single person in here wants to belong, you want to be loved, and you want to be affirmed. And guess what? Your soul wants that from God more than anyone else. And when you understand that about yourself, right, and, and this is what's so powerful because, again, this is before Jesus began his, his ministry, and, and it was at his, his baptism. You know, I was uh, preaching one Sunday, and Someone got Pentecostal on me, and I loved it, and they came up at the end of service, and, and they said, hey, I just got this word I want to speak over you, and I said, all right, I'll receive it, and, uh, and this, this guy proceeded to talk about this story, and he said, guess what? Jesus was baptized, and then he was spoken over by the Father. He said, did you know that was before he ever did any miracles? Did you know that was before he ever tried to do anything in ministry? Did you know that it was at the beginning, at the baptism, where God said, you're mine, I love you, I'm pleased with you? Did you catch that he didn't have to earn it? He didn't have to strive for it? 
that God gave it to him. And I think it's so fascinating when you think Jesus chose to do this, uh, this baptism, and that's when the Father affirmed him. Why that matters for me and you today is because, listen, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you profess that publicly in baptism, which, by the way, we're doing next month again, uh, it's in that moment before you even try to do ministry, you try to live in your gifting, try to serve the community, before you do any of that, it's in that moment God said, no, I made you new. You're now my child. I love you. You belong to me, and I'm pleased with you, and nothing you do is going to change that. I got you now. I love you now. Nothing is going to change that. Guess who needs to hear that? I do. Because I want to live in the pleasure of the Father so I don't have to try to please everyone else. I need to know who I am to move forward because we're all going to face confrontation. And the way that we can do that is with the right ID, with the right identification. And by the way, just practical application to the fathers in the house tonight or today. Is, is notice that, that the father gave Jesus three things. He gave him attention, right? I'm here with you. I'm right here at your baptism, right? He gave him uh, a, affection. He said, I love you. And then he, sa- he gave him uh, encouragement, right? I'm pleased with you. C- can I just tell you, if you're raising children, especially small children, but listen, don't quit when they get older. Fathers in the house today, listen to me. Give them attention, individual attention. Give them affection. Man, say I love you. Don't say, oh, they know I love No, you love them and you say you love them. Even on the days where you don't always like them. You tell your kids with your mouth. Because it matters. It cements something in their spirit. That they're loved. So you give them attention. You say, I love you. And guess what? You tell them you're pleased with them before they have to do anything. I've made a habit out of this. It affected me so much. You know, I was like, man, I need to figure out how to do this with my kids. And so when I get to put them to bed at night and I try to do this as often as I can, I'm there with them. I want to give them attention individually. And then we start doing these individual kind of date hangouts with each of our kids. And you know what? And then I tell them I love them. And even when my son, Willem's seven, and he's not sure if that's cool anymore, I still tell him. So I love you, son. And then here's the kicker. I try to tell him, listen, I'm so happy I get to be your daddy. It's not on them. It's on, I'm happy I get to be your daddy. And the, the, they just smile, right? And even if we had a hard day, sometimes you have a hard day. You don't always go right. You don't do everything perfect. And then, but you know what? God still looks at you and says, you're my child. I love you. And I have joy being your father. Let me ask you, have you received that from God today? Do you know that's who you are as a child of God? Have you gotten your new ID set in your mind yet? Because it's that identification that you can face confrontation. And listen, as you live in the affirmation of God over your life, because some of you need to receive the affirmation of God. Once you have the affirmation inside of you, you can live with the authority that he's given you. I want to call us today. Let's break out the prison of people pleasing. I want to hear every, you know, I want to hear, I don't know if I'll get to hear it, but I hope we all hear it one day. And I hope it's said over everybody here that God says, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you cared about what I cared about, right? The way we'll do that is to know how much God loves us. Why don't you stand? We're going to respond and worship. Let me pray for us. Father, we just receive today. I thank you that you're a good father that, that gives. Lord, I pray for anybody today who just Father's Day is a hard day, just for whatever reason, that they would take all of that out of the picture and just receive from you. Would you restore somebody today? Would you restore a father today? Would you call him higher today? Would you speak life into his spirit today? Would you tell him he's your son today? Would you tell him you love him today? Would you open his eyes to the joy that you have being our father? Would you raise up men that are going to change the world, starting in their own heart, starting in their own family, in their own lives? Would you do a new thing? Would you do a miraculous thing in our spirits today? Move in all of our hearts, we ask in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.